You are very, very welcome to another episode of the Mighty Mini Podcast with me, your host, Enda O'Doherty. Just before I introduce today's guest, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, the first thing is, I won't say the name of the gentleman, but um, the gentleman, he is a gentleman who sent me a lovely email about his current struggles and his battle with cancer. Can I just say, um, you had me in floods of tears initially, but you also had me full of hope and full of energy and full of passion because your letter was just absolutely um, incredibly inspiration to see the bravery that you are fighting your fight with. So if you're listening to the podcast, I know you're a regular listener. Um, I wish you a great day and thank you for sharing your story with me. Um, the Mighty Mini podcast only exists when people share, like, and please continue to do that. And if you have any ideas, please reach out to me and let me know who you'd like to hear on the podcast or what ideas you'd like to hear about. Of course, the mighty ones are where I have a long guest on for 40 minutes or so. And the minis are where you can sit on the loo, make some toast and listen to some rantings or ideas by me. But today we truly have a mighty, mighty episode. So my guest today is the wonderful Claire Watts. Good morning, Claire. Good morning. I'm delighted to be on. Thanks a million. Thanks a million. Can I tell you stuff about Claire? So Claire is famous or infamous for being a free diver, and we'll get into all that in a minute. And I was aware of her. I'd seen her on television because she's very famous and because she does one of the most dangerous sports in the world. But the reason she's on the podcast today was I met Claire at a recent event where we both spoke, which was our TEDx Rat Oath. And hello to all the TEDx Rat Oath crew. And if you haven't seen it, check out TEDx Rath Oath. You can listen to mine, it's okay, but listen to Claire's and it will absolutely blow the socks off you. It was amazing. But I think what blew me away that day, Claire, and I know I said this to you personally beforehand, uh, was Claire's kindness. So those of you watching this on YouTube will see that I have forgotten to put some makeup on and there's a giant big shiny spot on top of my bald head with all of my spotlights here in the studio. And uh, in advance of TEDx, if you have a look, if I'm looking good, uh, which is a hard thing for me to do. Um, the reason is Claire did my makeup on the day, kept me calm, but I loved the way she reached out to everyone who was speaking that day. And rather than finish her speak or to her, her presentation disappeared, uh, Claire continued to spread happiness, energy and positivity through everyone. So thanks for that, Claire. And I, and I mean that you really made my day. It was lovely to meet you. Claire, let's jump straight into it. I really wanted to say, let's dive straight into it. And then I went, Jesus, Andy, you can't say that to a free diver. That's really everyone does <laughs> over. If you're watching on YouTube, um, there's an amazing photograph. It's the cover of Claire's book. And I'm going to say to you, when I read the book, um, it was not what I was expecting. I really was expecting holding my breath and to be done on a page. I wasn't expecting it to be to be as varied, as funny, as different as it was. It's a really, really good read. And if you want to read something different that will improve your quality of life, I'd really recommend the book. Claire, let's let's go, let's go to South America. Tell me and tell the people listening, how did you end up even diving in the first place? Uh good question. I um, end of 2014, I was done. I was fed up. Um, I worked in Lambert Puppet Theatre and we were just doing our panto season. And I remember, you know, it was mid season. So we were doing, you know, a couple of shows a day, every, you know, every day. I remember parking up. I was just going for a little break and it was absolutely lashing rain. It was, you know, mid December. And I just thought, oh, get me out of here. <laughs> and... My brother had been to Colombia, uh, you know, on a summer trip the, the, the summer before, and he had kind of planted the seed of the idea. So I kind of tested out loud over Christmas, you know, at the Christmas dinner over Turkey saying, I think I might go to South America on my own and see, does anyone give me a strange look? And they just ignore me at this stage. Um, so on New Year's Eve, I booked a ticket. Jesus. And I, went, I was gone, I think, within within four weeks. So over those period of months, I I played the say yes game. And that was to say yes to things that scared the living daylights out of me. <laughs> and obviously keep a few note cards in the back pocket for safety reasons. Yeah. Um, but I was trying everything. I was trying scuba diving. I was uh, I did quad biking, mountain biking, paragliding. We'll never say yes to that again. And. Um, <laughs> So, you know, this is kind of the role I was on. And then, you know, a, a couple of months in, I was on a snorkeling trip because I, I am pulled towards water activities. I was on a sn snorkeling trip and I was with a group of lads and they kicked down and went into a cave 
and came back at the other side. A little, a little swim through, a little cave. Mm. And I just, I was watching them and I'm quite competitive. So I tried to keep up and my ears stopped me. So <laughs> afterwards, um, very nonchalantly, I don't imagine, I asked them, what, what, how, 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 what was this? So they described this as being free diving, that they had done a course the, the week previously. So I got my phone out. I started Googling free diving. Where can I learn it? How <laughs> can I learn it? And the next day, I made my way over to an island off Honduras. So that's as you Central do. Africa. As you do, exactly. <laughs> you know, I booked a plane, train, and an automobile, and then a boat um, to Utila. And I, I remember I walked up and it's this kind of like backpacker Caribbean island. And I took off my flip flops and I stuck them inside my backpack. So I'm walking up the street barefoot and I saw the free dive shop. I was like, right, I'll go in and book my beginner's course. And then next door, there was a scuba shop. So I said, I'll, I'll buy 10 dives. So that's me sorted for my time here. So I'll do my free diving and then I'll scuba dive because I presumed that's what I'd want to do. And I did my beginner's course and I've never put a tank of oxygen on my back again. That was it. I was hooked. I gave well, from, away. From, from, reading, uh, from reading the book and reading your records, I don't think you need a tank of oxygen. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think you have the lungs that are the equivalent of tank of oxygen. And listen, for anyone, um, anyone I know at the moment on Netflix, there's the, the fantastic uh, documentary called Breathe. Is that what it's called? Keep his breath. Breath. Okay. And it's, it's um, I've watched that and... I love water, but I'm a little bit claustrophobic. And I have to say, I found myself on the couch repeatedly holding my breath instead of enjoying the documentary. For, for anyone listening to this or watching this for the first time, like, what the hell is free diving? You know, like you just said, you have to pay for it. It's clearly not free, Claire. Definitely not free. Um, <laughs> it, it's funny because because of the documentary, lots of people are being introduced to free diving. Yeah. So more often than not, you know, I turned on a radio show, a well-known radio show last week. And we had Mary from Bali de Hob complaining about these lunatics holding their breath underwater. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I guess to no slight to Mary from de Hob, Bali de Hob. Um, but my point is, you know, lots of new people are learning about the sport and to the uninitiated. And if you're just if you're just learning about freediving through the, doc the documentary, of course, it seems like madness. Mm. It seems extreme. It seems highly dangerous. But I guess for me, you know, I've been explaining it as free diving is like running. Running, you can do a couch to 5K. You can do a 10K. You can do a marathon. And then you could do a trail run up a mountain with no shoes at night in the snow and no orientation. So it's a full spectrum, but all te technically it's all running. And I guess free diving is like that. So what yeah. you see Frida in the film or the documentary, which is beautiful, and a lot of my friends are in it, so it's a really emotional watch. Um, but it, that's one end; it, it's the highest end to to almost a stunt level. Yeah, yeah. Let's start. It, it's it's, it's funny. I think we 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 sorry to drop. I think we had we have the kindred spirits that uh, haven't been free diving, but. There's a connection there. Um, so I, I know when I was climbing Kilimanjaro with my washing machine or when I was doing nine marathons in eight days, my my dad and my mom, God rest her soul, would repeatedly say, are you trying to kill yourself? Are you, are you trying to die? Are you very hard on yourself? And I, I remember one day just being sort of sulky and I turned to my dad and said, he said, you're not afraid of dying. And I said, I'm afraid of not living in a big sulky voice. And it was only when I said it, I realized, yeah, I want to suck the bloody juice out of every minute of every day and if that means uh climbing up a wall with a washing machine in africa on your back so be it for me yeah. it's like it's not i'm not trying like like i'm very conscious that i had kids and a family and i didn't want to hurt myself and i was there to save lives but that essence of feeling alive does is does free diving do that for you yeah absolutely um free diving so it's the sport of holding your breath underwater and usually when I'm referring to free diving, I'm referring to the depth aspect. So what that is, is um, lying flat on the surface of the water, taking a deep breath and descending as, as, as far as you're going to go. And um, you'll have decided beforehand. Um, so, yeah, like obviously it seems extreme and, you know, I'd be lying 
through my teeth if I said there wasn't uh, an element of danger. But when it comes, like, I'm a fraidy cat. <laughs> fraidy cat. This is the thing. Um, so, f- but free diving doesn't doesn't even make it onto my radar in terms of should be scared and the reason for that is the preparation that's done around it so when I you know on Utila uh you know barefoot and in, in bikinis that kind of living when I learned about freediving you know so much time is spent learning about your breathing learning about relaxation most importantly learning about quietening your mind so a really big part of freediving is what you take down with you yeah and for me, it's a noisy place in there. And once I started to peel back the layers of how to do this, because, you know, it takes years and I'm still nowhere near there. Of Once you start to learn how to, to quiet and to address those those thoughts that might run through your mind. Yeah, that's that's the draw. That's the addiction, as, as people like to call it. Yeah, that's that's that sounds magic. That that resonates. I remember early on when I started having my, my first mental health crisis and I came off alcohol, I began to experience panic attacks and uh, nightmares and night terrors. And I remember very early on, I went to um, a CBT guy and, you know, we were going to talk about the first thing he said to me is uh, he said, a lot of your anxiety is coming from your breathing. And I, the first instantly I thought, shit, there's 60 euro wasted. This lunatic is going to tell me take a breath and that's going to fix all of my problems. But Fast forward, um, I suppose, 10, 11 years later, I was breathing shallower and shallower and shorter and shorter. I was producing adrenaline. I was producing all sorts of negative stress hormones, which Mm. I physically could feel in my stomach. I could feel in my shoulders. I could feel it in my arms. I thought I was going mad and that made it worse. Mm. And, And the funny thing is now, if I have a nightmare or a night panic attack, I'm the, my first port of call is, it, like you say, is to control the breathing side of it. Mm. And then I can go after the mind side of it. Do you find um, do you find that a lot of people struggle to understand that connection between breathing and happiness and energy? I think I think there's a far greater awareness of it now than there was 10 years ago. And particularly over the pandemic and COVID, um, people are looking um, I kind of think of it like, you know, equipping themselves with as much tools or as many tools as possible to aid with feelings of stress or anxiety. Um, I suppose for me, look, I'm a I'm a breath instructor, a breath coach, and you know, I I also teach singing, so kind of um breath control and diaphragmatic breathing. This has been part of my my professional vocabulary for years and years and years. So, you know, free diving then, that space in between an inhale and an exhale, you know, that kind of blew the whole thing right up for me. So now I, I teach people about breathing, how to breathe, how to regulate breathing and, you know, for whatever, chronic stress, um, all sorts of issues. Anyway, um, yeah, so I think there's a far greater awareness, but it's funny, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. And, you know, you teach tools and I think people expect it to work quicker than it does. So for me, I think about, you know, times of high stress. I'm not going to learn anything new at that time. If I am in the throes of panic or or whatever it is that consumes me, let's wait for the bells of the church to finish. <laughs> it's okay. We're not, we're not getting them at all. It's our Bray soundtrack. It's okay. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm not going to sit and learn a new skill at that moment. So I need to rely on what I know. So what I try to do in in calm times, you know, as part of daily ritual, daily habit is take a couple of moments every day. And realistically, sometimes that is just while well, I'm waiting for the kettle to boil. You know, it's not necessarily a rolling out yoga mat and lighting candles job, um, but it is taking time to check in with my breath to notice to create an awareness and to try and correct or to to adapt a little bit more to you know slow lower breathing through my nose i'm um, trying to move my body into rest and digest as opposed to that constant fight or flight 
Yeah, bloody hell, I could listen to you say that over and over again. That was a bit hypnotic. I was going there for a second. Um, yeah, I, I find that really hard. Like, I, I find, Jesus, I describe my head sometimes, I feel like it's a firework, firework factory. Like, we're on the podcast here, I'm thinking of the next question, or I'm thinking, God, I'm trying to think that's a really interesting thing, or I must remember to do that later. But generally in life, I, my biggest difficulty at the moment, I think, is that idea of being calm, switching off. Like, I'm, I'm completely manic in my head. Like we, we I, I flew to Liverpool um, in the last day or two. I think I sent you a picture, yeah. but um, it was amazing. Like, but uh, like on the plane to Liverpool, it's a 30 minute flight on the fl- plane back. I wrote seven pages of ideas of things that I want to do, you know, mm-hmm. and my wife slept and listened to classical music. And I was like, I'm so jealous. I was like, how does she do yeah. this? How does she do this? But uh <laughs> No, it was it was it was a manic trip. But do you know the, the podcasting is really interesting. I get to meet amazing people like you. I, the, you know, if, if people look back at previous podcasts, I've had the most fantastic stories, the most amazing people on. But and we tried to be professional. But there's a ten year old stuck in me. I'm dying to ask the question everyone asks: How long can you hold your breath for? And I know there's there's the distance one, and then I know there's like face breathing one as well. So yeah. just just to shock the shit out of people, t- how long can you at your best? What we ask uh 559 jesus mary and joseph 559 so your challenge today ladies and gentlemen when you're finished listening to the podcast is don't 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 lie down lie down on the couch and hold your breath i'd say most people get to about 25 seconds and feel like they're going to suffocate you know and and what was the depth claire what's what's what have you hit going down Um, it's funny the number seems to be um special for me or significant for me 59 meters right so 59 and 59 meters yeah um, and that was a couple of years ago i have long covid now so uh, my lungs are somewhat more compromised and um, i haven't done any training in a couple of years um, yeah I, re- I remember when you told me that at the ted that you'd been nabbed by covid and i was thinking like never really thought about it before you know when you're in, you need to put ourselves into someone else's shoes like COVID for anyone else was a cough and a bit of, you know, a bit of nose and it cleared up or whatever. And, you know, I know for some people, tragically, it, it meant death. But for you, who who worked, used your lungs as your sport, as your profession, to lose lung capacity, that's like, I just, it was, it was shocking to when I heard it, you know. I, my actual bout of COVID was mild, mild to moderate. I did go to hospital for a night. Um, but it's funny, I remember walking, I'm on the third floor, uh, in an apartment block and we don't have a lift and I remember walking down the stairs behind the paramedic to the ambulance and I remember just thinking these lungs don't fit wow. it's like on someone else's shoes I'm like they're not mine they don't fit right. it was it felt so so bizarre um I've recovered considerably um, um my main symptom at the moment or has been since start of 2021 is chronic fatigue so you know you mentioned we uh, met at TEDx Rathof uh, which was it still makes me smile it was such an incredible day yeah uh, but in the lead up so that I would have the energy for it the the week leading up I'd take it really really easy wow um, they take it easy it's kind of like it's lying flat in bed, blinds closed, so reducing stimulation, um, no screens. Um, it sounds very luxurious, um, but I guarantee you it's not the best place. Uh, yeah, it's an, it's an amazing. I, I know I was talking to someone recently who was telling me that with, they knew a teacher who got COVID and lost their voice. Yeah. Um, I know someone else who had partial hearing loss and then you had that. I think that idea of of walking in someone else's shoes, like when you told me, I was really shocked. Um. I remember telling someone recently we were talking about COVID and they were saying, God, you know, it seems so distant now. And I was saying, yeah, like lots of good things came out of it. I spent time with my family, but, um, you know, one of the things I'd share with that, with people that, you know, that idea of thinking about other people was as an alcoholic for me, um, it was absolute torture because every single building I went in and out of, I had to wash my hands with alcohol. And we walk into town, I could tell you the quality of alcohol content in, um, different shops in Waterford or in Dublin. I I started avoiding Tesco because they had exceptionally good quality uh, hand sanitizer, and everyone else was washing their hands to avoid COVID. And I can remember standing in Tesco and the cold sweat running down my back because I was just after washing my hands with vodka. I could smell it clear as day, you know. 
And uh, it, it's funny. We don't know what people what, what, what people. Oh, my God, that's such a stark image that wouldn't cross my mind. Yeah. That's yeah. Horrible. You know, I, I said to someone, it's like, imagine you were like chronically morbid obese and, and somebody told you six times, 10 times a day, wash your hands in chocolate sauce. Yeah. You know, and you were on a, on a, on a life threatening diet. But uh, it got through. Hey, look, sure, everyone has, has something different. And um, the other the other 10 year old question that I, it's busting in my head, I'm going to ask. I can ask. It's my yeah. purpose. I can ask. Is like, what's the most trouble you've got in? And I don't mean in the real world because I know your bowel is be damned. But I mean, in the water, like how, how hairy has it got? Has it got to a point sometime where you went, oh, that wasn't good. That was that was that wasn't uh, that wasn't pleasant. Please see aforementioned scaredy cat. <laughs> um, no, I, I I have blacked out in the water. Um, I blacked out on the surface after a competition dive. Um, I represented Ireland in the World Championships in 2019, September 2019. And my first competition dive, I blacked out at the surface. So, yeah, that's like... And, you know, if you watch the documentary, you'll see all variations of what that might look like. And it, again, mm. it's a spectrum and it can be quite extreme. Um, I it, It's not scary for me because I don't remember it. Yeah, I imagine it was the most scary for people watching, uh, particularly my family. Yeah. Um, yeah, like. It does happen because when you I think for me, what it demonstrates is how powerful thoughts are because I had done that dive again and again and again and it was quite a conservative dive for me actually I wanted an easy dive to start to kick the competition off with yeah um and I didn't feel nervous now the conditions were shocking but it shows the power of thought and how much oxygen that actually consumes so when you are limited in your oxygen and, you know, keeping your mind nice and clear means that you come up fully conscious. And then overthinking, thinking or overthinking is the difference between staying conscious and blacking out. Wow. Yeah, that's that's amazing. That's amazing that our, our brain can be that powerful. Uh, it's probably a bit of a rude story. I shouldn't really share it, but I think it's, um, it's the, if my friend Martin Malloy is listening to this, Martin, Martin is the one who told me this story. So hi, Martin. Um when I was walking from Belfast to Waterford, my washing machine, we were somewhere outside Kilkenny and I wasn't in a great place. I was on Marathon 7 and I was feeling a bit rough. And he said to me, come on. I said, I really need to go to the loo. And he said, go on over there in the gate. And as you can imagine, like getting getting your, your business out to have a wee with a washing machine strapped to your back, it's not really easy. <laughs> and it's not worth the effort because you have so much harnesses and straps and it's not worth the energy. And like, you know, he said into the gate and I said, Martin, I'm not exactly invisible. Like I've got a massive big washing machine strapped onto my back. So I said, I'll wait. Now he told me this a few days after the event. I don't remember saying to him, he said, I said to him, I'll wait. And he said, why? And I said, because at that stage I had two broken feet. And I said to him, the pain from my bladder absolutely exploding, needing to pee is a different frequency pain from the pain in my feet. And the pain in my bladder will take the mind off my pain in my feet. Peace. And then I said to him, and when I do pee, I am going to get the most orgasmic blast of happy chemicals. <laughs> it was only after he said to me, Jesus, I, like he said, I knew you were in a different place from all of us pain wise and effort wise and concentration wise. But he said, like when you're controlling your thoughts to the point of manipulating a pee over a broken foot, he said, I realized like, Jesus, uh, he said, I went home that night and I said to my wife, like, he, he's not with us anymore. He's gone. He's on yeah. another planet. It's, it's a different level, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it is. Can I ask you to look, you know, uh, on the podcast here, we get like, honest to God, no one's questions are going to be like yours. They couldn't possibly be. But I have one common question to ask everyone. And that is if um, you could head back to the future. So if I bought you a DeLorean, Claire, and we headed uh, to 88 kilometers or 88 miles per hour, and uh, we pressed that button on the flux capacitor and we <clears throat> we went back to the future or back to any date you like. Where in your life or can you think of a time that you would revisit? Now, I've had some brilliant answers. And if people go back through the podcast, I had Mary Lou MacDonald had a great answer and Keith Barry had a great answer. Um, okay. I had Derek McGrath, the Watford hurling manager. His answer, I loved it. He said he'd go back to when he was 10 playing six hour football matches in front of his house. Um, I had one guest, I'm trying to remember who it was, one guest said to me, they refused the keys to the car. 
because they said the memory they had, maybe it's imperfect. Maybe what they see now in their, you know, 2020 vision, it was a perfect time in their life. And maybe if they went back, they'd be disappointed. Mm -hmm. But uh, can you think of a time in your life that you would, if we gave you that DeLorean, when would you go back to? Like, it's a really boring answer. Um, but the first thing that's coming to my head is I'd probably go back uh, to 2014 to sitting in the car um, near the puppet theatre in the absolute pissings of rain and I'd just get into the passenger seat and just say you have no idea what's coming next <laughs> go go quick <laughs> oh. and I think I like I'd love to go back and just be a little bit kinder to myself Um. I'd love to get to almost do it again. And I don't know if that's the premise of the question. Um, no, it is. It is. And to, to be fully present in it because it is all going to work out. And um, I think that time in my life was just consumed by a lot of fear, by a lot of self-doubt, by a lot of comparison and not really stepping into my own journey. And I think like, to be honest, that's, that's a really big part of what my book is to, to it's essentially what I did to go back throughout those moments and kind of map out the different points. Um, yeah, it's not really the most. No, it's, it's, it's a perfect answer. answer. It's, it's, I love um, it. I love it, just, it. What it does is it makes me think that in 10 years time, I'll just turn 50 and I'll be sitting there thinking, I wish I went back to her. Remember, she did a podcast. What was that guy's name again? He's bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back to her and I want to say, mm, enjoy the journey more. It's actually yeah. all going to be okay. Yeah, that's so, that's powerful wisdom. Powerful mm -hmm. wisdom. I had, I, I was sitting in the back garden one day uh, years ago and I got this phone call and this lady said, hello, good morning. Could I speak to Endo Doherty? And I said, how are you speaking? And she goes, this is Sonia Sullivan. And I was on the tip of my tongue was, it isn't, it's because I know what yeah. my friends are like. And I was like, yeah, right, Sonia yeah. Sullivan. And uh, it was, right. <laughs> and she had heard about this madman running around raising funds for mental health charities, carrying a washing machine. And she said, I just rang to say best of luck. And I, I was like, oh my God. And wow. she's so nice. And then she started asking him. She was all interested in my training. Like, how do you train with a washing machine or what do you do? But it's really funny. She said exactly what you said. I said to her, just chatting the phone, I said, you know, look back over your amazing career. Do you have any regrets? Like, what or what advice would you give me? And she said, when I ran in the Olympics, it was for a six minute race or four minute race. And she said, four or eight years of my life were focused right down on four minutes. And she said, really, what I missed out was the journey. She said, I, if I could go back, it was the people, the culture, the food, the travel, the crack, the the adventures. I missed out all of that because I was just tunnel vision on this one event, you know, at this one time in my life. And it was it, it's something that stuck with me because I've really tried to enjoy the adventure. You know, I'm, I'm really conscious of 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 living a different life, you know. Um, so yesterday, uh, yesterday. I had the maddest experience. I did a cycling tour in Liverpool of the Beatles locations. And it started off with the tour guide. And he said, hey, let's form a band. And we're all sitting on the bikes going, what? He said, we need a drummer. So we cycled to Ringo Starr's house. OK, <laughs> and he told us Ringo's family history and the house outside Ringo's house. And it was brilliant. And he goes, you know what? We need a, we need a bass player. And then the other tour guide goes, hey, I know this guy called pa Paul McCartney. He lives not far away. <laughs> We cycled to Paul McCartney's house, singing, twist and shout. They had a speaker on the bike. Everyone in Liverpool is looking at these six people traveling through Liverpool city centre, singing Beatles songs, you know, yeah. got really, it was, I got roasted. You can probably see on the video, the top of my head is like a rasher, but 28 degrees and we needed something to drink. And someone said, Do you know where we should go? Let's go and hang out in Strawberry Fields. And someone said, how long will we stay there for? And the other guy goes, forever. Forever, right? exactly. But we're cycling along singing Strawberry Fields forever. And the whole, like I spent six hours cycling, singing Beatles songs. And like I got back to the hotel, myself and my wife, and we went, wow. Like, you know, I sat on a wall in a churchyard where John Lennon and Paul McCartney smoked cannabis, looking at a grave for of a woman called Eleanor Rigby and decided they'd write a song about it for the crap. Like, it was just amazing. But I think I think you're right. Seizing the moment, enjoying the day, um, in, in, in enjoying our life, enjoying the adventure. And, and I like earlier, Claire, you said too about that idea of not being a prisoner of fear. I was forever like, I think it's because I was a teacher, like, 
what would people say? What should you wear? What would people think? What would my mother say? What would my father think? What would my brother or sister think? And now I've got to the point where it's like, feck it, do it, live, you know, enjoy, enjoy. What fear, um, you know, you talk there about, you know, I said earlier about, you know, that idea of being afraid of not living. What fears or what negatives do you think still hold you back in life? Do you, do you still, I know you, you've, you've transformed what you were doing um, and, and your life is continuing to evolve and transform. I, I, I'm amazed watching you as a performer, how you're getting better and better. Anyone who's listened to you on the radio, but are there fears or doubts? What, what still consumes you, Claire? What? Jesus, they're all there. Like, they're, <laughs> you know, I like, I, I don't know if they'll ever go away, but I, I think I talk about it in my TED Talk. In fact, my TED Talk just came out over the weekend and I watched it on Saturday evening and I kind of had to remind myself of my own message because in the month that's passed, there's been a lot of stuff going on personally. So my world has gotten smaller and with that, more fear comes in and, and makes the world smaller again. And, you know, you get caught up in that cycle. So just hearing my own words, I'm kind of going, oh, shit. Yeah. OK. OK. And, and I suppose my message or how I deal with fear is except where you are at in that moment. And that's been a really big thing for me with non COVID because so much of the time is, oh, I wish I was back at the time when I could. Yeah. Or I will do it when I can. Well, I don't know if those points I'll ever reach again. Or I don't know if I'll reach those points again. So where am I at now of, of accepting where I am at this exact moment and trying to move myself forward, however slowly? But, you know, I think fear will always be a part of my life. Um, and, and fear for me manifests in imposter syndrome, this widely overused term. <laughs> um, but, you know, in, in that voice that says, who the fuck do you think you are to be writing a book? Yeah. Who's going to read it? You don't even write, you know, or <laughs> or seeing someone else on Instagram write two books and you go, oh, what's the point in writing only yeah. one? You know. Spe speaking of which, I'm consumed with jealousy. Like, never mind breathing or mindset or anything else. If you just want good quality crack and entertainment every day, follow Claire on Instagram. Her Instagram feed is bloody brilliant. I don't know who, where you're getting all the ideas from, but I'm so jealous. My Instagram looks like uh, like the parish uh, Instagram account and yours is great crack. I love it every day. It's really, really good. It's always, it's always different. Are you always happy, Claire? Like every time I've met you... Oh. You are, but you're incredibly positive and jolly and happy. Like every, like, like, I was backstage and I came around after the the TED talk and I bawled like a baby. And my wife said, "Well, how did you come? What were people like?" And I said, "I said you're one Claire." I said, "I was completely wrong about her. She's mad crack. I said, she made me laugh my head off. Like you were on a roll. You were like, I, I know there was no illicit drugs, but you were really happy. Are you always positive and upbeat?" Uh, no, God, no. In fact, you think the opposite. Um, <laughs> but one, one spurs on the other. I, I, I think both are really valid. And it's funny, yeah. I'm one of these people, I'm I'm desperate at pretending. So if I'm not up there, I, I just won't be. And something right. I do, I go, I'm shite. Yeah. I'm here. Okay. This where we're at. You know, I, I'm actually quite happy. And I love when I ask someone, you know, how are you doing today? And they go, Mm, and they tell me the actual truth as well as oh. ask your to know yourself one full of blah, 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 and this Irish kind of pitter patter. Um, but yeah, no, of course I'm not. I do. I enjoy. Um, I obviously I enjoy having the crack. And did, I think you, so you did well to keep going there when I dipped off the chair. Anyone on YouTube? Because yeah, yeah. all I was thinking was, yes, there was a time in my life, Claire, when I said to people, how exactly. are you? And, and I said, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> and I hate it. And the photograph was exactly the opposite. Yeah. I think I'm better too with that now. If someone says to me, how are you? I'll say, I'm, I think I overdose people. They say, how are you? And I'll say, uh, you know, my prostate's not great and uh, I have an earache <laughs> and I have a throat infection and uh, didn't sleep well last night and I have about three euro left in the bank and I had a booking for a gig and they cancelled and I'm in pissed off. Or, and about a, a minute into that monologue, I could see people going, um, we, we didn't really want to know. <laughs> Fine, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't want to know Claire what's coming next for you in life what's I know the speaking is the direct is the direction you're going and can I just say when I was doing some legal and healthy stalking in advance of this podcast um your website is absolutely beautiful the photography on it is stunning absolutely stunning friends very yeah. 
Oh, hey, listen, if you're not interested in booking Claire as a speaker, that's 100 percent fine. But have a look at the photographs on on the website. They're 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 beautiful. They're so beautiful. Who who took those? Oh, uh, they're they're a variety of different uh, photographers that mainly work in the water. So and um, there's a, a pal of mine, Neil Meehan, who's based out in Greystones. He swims every day at sunrise and he's taken lots of portraits of me in the water. Uh, a very another talented woman, uh, Nana is Danish and she, I have the best crack with her in the water and we take some <laughs> mad looking shit. Yeah. Uh, it's so funny. You'll, I'll come out of a session with Nana and my eyes are tiny because I've been in the salt water and I have like water dripping from my nasal patch. It's disgusting. And yeah. then she produces these things. I'm like, what split second did you manage to capture amid yeah. mayhem? Um, and another photographer, Dan Verhoeven. So I'd recommend people checking them out there. Yeah, they're... have a have a look at them. They're amazing photographs. It's like it's it's not what you expect in the water, you know. Uh, Can I say one thing about sure. fear? It's kind of been a theme and it's something I'm thinking a lot about at the moment. And I just said, you know, fear is still a really big mm. part of my life. Um fear is a really big part of my life, but another really big driver is curiosity. I I have quite a playful nature and my whole thing is playful curiosity. And I think the great thing about that is they can coexist. So you don't have to deny that you're feeling scared. You don't have to deny that every fiber of your being is saying, what the fuck? And, and telling you to stop <laughs> doing it. Yeah. I think playful curiosity is so gentle and sneaky. It can coexist. Yeah. And for me, that's how I manage to get through or to approach things or or to try something new um so i don't think fear is necessarily a bad thing it just needs a partner to yeah. redirect it a little bit and that partner for me is always playful curiosity that's brilliant i love that i really love that i'm i'm i, I instantly wrote down fearful curiosity because when this is finished the, the the crappy bits that people don't see about podcasts is then this has to have an intro and outro. It has to have artwork. It has to be uploaded. It has to be edited. It has to be digitally scrubbed. All those things have to be done. And then you have to come up with a, a good title. But I, I like that. Fearful Curiosity. That's really good. Um, I was going to go with, um, I can't hold my breath forever, but I don't know. We'll wait. Some, some inspirational thing will, will hit me and we'll use the logo. We'll use the cover of the book as well. Claire, it's been an absolute joy to have you on. I, I knew you'd be this good. I really, really enjoyed our conversation. Um, every time I meet you either give me an idea or a smile and that's the kind of people we need to have in our life Claire Walsh thank you so much for coming on the Mighty Mini Podcast Cheers thanks so much <laughs>